welcome everyone to this month's first Friday's um, online seminar. And um, it's a pleasure to have um, with us um, Dr. Carlo Razzi and Professor Massimo, Massimo Grassi. Uh, they're going to present their recent experiments on, on listening experiments on Stradivari violin. So, um, Carlo, uh, please introduce yourself and uh, go ahead. Yes, thank you very much uh, to the organizer for this wonderful opportunity we have to share with you our work. Um, I'm pretty new to the community, actually, so a few words about me are in order. Um, I'm a physicist, and um, my job is basically applying quantum mechanics to study condensed matter and molecular physics. So totally unrelated with acoustics. Uh, however, I was a, a violin player since long time, so basically since when I was a kid. And um, I also played professionally, and I had the chance to Pronto. be a teacher in... Uh, in uh... Pronto. Hello? So, some, someone else is talking, maybe? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm trying to mute everyone. Go ahead. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, I had the chance to also teach uh, briefly at the, at the Valimeki School in Cremona, where I was born. So somehow I brought with me this passion for music and being a scientist sooner or later, I had to fall into the trap of doing some research or so in, in uh, acoustics. That uh, is supposed to uh, occur, uh, let's say, episodically, not systematically because I'm not so much free time, but uh, let's hope this is, uh, uh, I, I see we have raised some interest in the community, so let's hope we can at least uh, continue discussing with all of you uh, there. Maybe Massimo, you want to say something about yourself before we start the presentation? Uh, so hi everybody, I also thank the organizers for this very nice opportunity. It's also one of the reasons why we have to uh, I mean, we can make a very good use of these uh, digital tools like Zoom, and uh, so we we can cross the ocean, uh, the oceans, and, and meet people. Uh, actually, uh, more than Carlo, I'm involved into auditory perception because I I work mainly in experimental psychology and I mainly work in uh, hearing and auditory perception. Although, however, it was Carlo that was driving me into this project because he was the one. I think the connections with the violin world and so on. I work in auditory perception here at the Department of General Psychology, although mainly I'm interested in psychoacoustics. So, so I normally deal with beeps, sinusoids, uh, synthetic tones and something like this. And actually this is the first time I was dealing with a proper real instrument, much less than Carlo um, into uh, uh, playing uh, music, Mar uh, Carlo is definitely much more a musician than me. Uh, I, I have, like many, many, many persons in my field, a background in music because I, I was playing uh, guitar rock when I was a teenager, uh, so with long hair and so on. So a, a very typical career for people in my field. Uh, and Actually, for me, this was uh, the very first time to have an opportunity to put the hands on a proper instrument and run a psychological experiment uh, with real, real instruments rather than beeps and noises. Okay, please, Carlo, go. Uh, Carlo, you're muted. Yes, thank you. I will share my screen now and... Um, uh, then you see now the, the presentation, yep. right? Yes. Okay, this is just the acknowledgement for all the people who actually took part in this endeavor. Uh, apart from myself and Massimo who will be presenting, also Massimo Nucci at the uh, Department of Psychology in Padua. Fabio Antonacci from Politecnico di Milano is actually the guy who performed the uh, vibroacoustical measurements on the instruments in the lab, which is located in the museum in Cremona. And uh, Alessandro Voltini, who might, you might know, he's a master and teacher in the uh, Cremona Violin Making School. And actually, I will spend a few words about the um, um, origin of this project because uh, we, we initiated, I and Alessandro, I actually built upon on Alessandro's work. So this is the outline. I will explain you briefly the, the 
why we did all, all, the, all this and what we aim to. And uh, then my more detailed uh, explanation, uh, Massimo will be explaining in details the listening test. I will be talking about the physical part and then we all together will discuss. So uh, actually, uh, one of the inspirational uh, um, pictures was this one by, by that I took from Martin Schleske uh, website, I think, or, or from a publication, I don't remember exactly, but well, it is a poll in which uh, uh, people, I think violin players were asked, uh, what is the most important quality that the violin must have? And uh, as you can see, if you can read these small characters, timber, so Klangfarbe is by far the most, uh, considered the most important quality in a violin. Then there are other qualities, of course, balance, response, uh, modulability, volume, projection, but you can see uh, timbre is by far uh, outperforming all the others. Um, so evaluating a violin as a whole, of course, uh, requires balancing evaluation of many features. Now, the point is that even if we restrict ourselves to uh, the evaluation of timbre, this is uh, uh, in itself a multidimensional uh, quantity. And after all, what is exactly timbre in, in a violin? And uh, what does it mean to have a good timbre for, for an instrument? This is a deceptively simple question, actually, because it's, it's simple because I think that with a little bit of training and all of my violin makers and professional musicians has the, the, the training to do that, so with a little bit of training, everybody's immediately able to say, yeah, this, this violin is sounding good, this, this violin is sounding bad. But when, when you want to perform some scientific quantitative uh, definition of what uh, a good timbre is, uh, then it, it turns to be really uh, difficult. So I actually, um, 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 let's say applied to a call made by the violin making school uh, because they were uh, asking for experts to help, uh, let's say, bridging the field between uh, uh, musicians and scientists. So I felt I was kind of in a, in a good position to do that. And uh, when I went there, I discovered that uh, Maestro Voltini already did a, a great deal of work. He was already, already able to do let's say uh, very good quality uh, vibrational measurement using the impact hammer, recordings and so on. And he also started uh, uh, with the students a set of uh, uh, listening experiments, just uh, informal experiment by presenting several violins, making them play in a semi-blind way and uh, collecting uh, impression and discussing and so on. And he noticed that in fact, some violins uh, received, uh, let's say, a constant uh, 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 rating from, from the students. So we, we thought that it was time to try to uh, make all this experience more, more robust and more scientifically reproducible. And that's what, uh, why we started all this, all this uh, um, uh, endeavor. So the aim in the end is to investigate the perception of timbre. And we decided for a reason that will be clear in a moment to restrain ourselves to a specific way of playing the violin, which is the simplest one. Uh, sustained sound like detaché sound, no fancy balzato or, 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 uh, or complex uh, articulation. Um, we wanted also to establish uh, if uh, it's possible to define or to obtain an intersubjective uh, uh, definition of timbre. So uh, making people agree of what a good, a good timbre is and a bad timbre is on this subset of, of, of uh, uh, articulations. Define what is more or less pleasant timbre. And uh, in order to do that, uh, we, after a, a little uh, review of the literature, we realized that musician uh, and professional use a huge variety of uh, descriptors, subjective, or even metaphors, or even uh, 
I, I met a musician who had a, its own graphical way to depict what was in his brain, his uh, concept for the voice of a violin. So it's really difficult. And I, I, I suspect that this is also uh, strongly um, bound to the uh, cultural heritage of the individuals uh, on their background, probably also on their language, uh, mother tongue, I mean. So we uh, decided to fix a small set of descriptors, choosing them in, uh, in such a way that people in the in our intended audience, which was which was the violin makers in Cremona, were more familiar with. So we actually interviewed them around, and we we tested several combination, and we found that some were more familiar uh, with people, and um, some other were also familiar, but but they were were kind of unreliable, and so we we selected this carefully. Now, the final goal would be, of course, uh, what uh, interests, I think, uh, most of violin makers who are also scientifically inclined. So find the holy grail of, of, of scientific violin making. So uh, find match between listening results and the objective acoustic response of the instruments, which is independent on, on uh, individual evaluation. And uh, this part, of course, we, we didn't managed to uh, achieve fully, but I think we have some good uh, uh, clues. And um, I want to, uh, just to clarify even more uh, uh, what is the rationale and what is the scope, the intended scope for this, for this project. Uh, um, the most uh, common question between the, the makers that we interviewed and when, when we were presenting our project to them was, but come on, how can you ever judge the, the quality of the violin just playing few notes in this very boring uh, way? And uh, they all, uh, uh, I would say, rather systematically use this meta metaphor. So one can tell the difference between a Ferrari and the Cinquecento, uh, the small, uh, small Italian car. If you just uh, drive it downtown and uh, I mean, to really see the difference, you really should unleash the full power of, of the Ferrari in some uh, uh, racing track or uh, somewhere else. Well, uh, the answer is, is the following. Again, bear in mind that this, with this experiment, we didn't mean to evaluate some ill-defined overall violin quality or sound quality. We wanted to, to, to uh, uh, quantify a very well-defined thing, which is the, the, the quality of sustained sounds. And uh, uh, just a fun thing, uh, I, I, I have heard that there are people from New Zealand, so now I feel compelled to, to keep this presentation sparkling, otherwise people will fall asleep, will fall asleep probably. So I, I just had fun uh, doing some uh, fact checking about this metaphor. So is it really true that we can't tell the difference between a Ferrari and uh, a Cinquecento just uh, if we drive it uh, downtown? Well, I found on, on uh, YouTube this video. This is the sound of a Cinquecento. This is the sound of a Lamborghini. And it goes on and on. The video is made by clearly some fans of uh, sport cars. But I find it very amusing because if you are a musician, you can immediately tell very easily that uh, it's easy to spot the difference between these cars and you didn't even uh, allow them to move. So you just put the key on and turn it on. And the sound is enough to tell a lot of things about the mechanics uh, of, this, of these cars. So I don't think the metaphor is working. And out of the metaphor, this is exactly what we wanted to do with this experiment. Just turn the key on on this violins and see what happens. If people could distinguish them at this minimal level of excitation, then it's a good starting point because this is a very standardized way to excite violence. And maybe you can build uh, upon it in a, towards a more realistic uh, uh, performance of the violin. 
So I will soon leave the, the word to Massimo. Uh, just I wanted to show you the, the setup. In the end, we had uh, uh, an audience which basically mostly composed by, by violin makers and by young violin makers, so the students of the violin making school. And uh, they were put in this, uh, in this uh, auditorium that is uh, just behind the, the, the museum in Cremona. And this was the usual uh, setup that you are all familiar with, uh, like a, a sound transparent curtain, which allows to play the violins behind it without uh, disclosing their, their identity. The participants, uh, so we got uh, 87 records, but uh, then we discarded some of them because they were made from, by us or because uh, there were very few musicians taking part in uh, to the experiment and uh, uh, they were not uh, statistically significant. So in the end, we had 70 makers, 34 masters, 36 students. Uh, so basically, I, we, we consider only this, this part of the, of the records that we collected for the, for the analysis. And uh, this is the self-reported experience uh, of the of uh, the audience. We maybe we'll discuss if this had an effect or not. I can spoil a little bit. Not much. Um, these are the, the test violins that we use, and uh, you know, we we had a long uh, um, bargain with with the museum and with the owner of the of the instruments because they put a, a rather strict constraint on what we could or we could not say. And uh, basically what you see is what we can say. We are allowed to, to, to tell. So violin A is uh, uh, a modern violin. Uh, it's estimated value uh, anyway is uh, uh, not uh, so low, I would say. So, so it's, a, it's a completely uh, a handmade violin. Violin B was a Stradivari dated to the end of the golden period. Uh, I didn't, write out uh, the value, but you all know the value of these instruments. Violin C was again a modern, uh, even though less modern violin, uh, which uh, probably for its uh, history was uh, uh, rated uh, higher than violin A, so around the 100 uh, thousand euros. Violin D was a horrible uh, factory made violin that we uh, recovered in the violin making school. And uh, well, it's, it's very low value. Violin X, which is the reference in a moment, uh, Massimo will explain how the, the experiment was, was performed, was again another Stradivari, but from the late uh, uh, period of, uh, of uh, Stradivari. So I think I'm done and uh, Massimo, you can take over from here. Okay, yeah. thank you, Carlo. Okay, so uh, a brief now overview on the literature of what we know about auditory perception and uh, the perception of the violin sound. Okay, uh, first of all, there is a fairly large literature about the difference between musicians and musicians as far as auditory perception is concerned. I, I don't know whether I'm talking to musicians, violin makers, uh, uh, amateurs, or whatever, but in general, uh, it is something like 100 years that in auditory perception, we know that people that play music in general have better ears than people that do not play music not in any dimension of the sound. Uh, in some dimension, they are better. Uh, in some dimension, they are not so much better. But generally speaking, I mean, playing music in general makes your ears better, okay? And, uh, uh, um, and therefore, this is also the reason why you use violin makers. Um, uh, by comparing the timbers of sounds, I mean, I mean in the task, the, the, the people had to compare uh, simple sounds, uh, so they had to be scaled. Um, uh, Carlo was just mentioning that uh, a friend and colleague of us, uh, for example, tried to make the experiment, but he, he was a, a complete unexpert and he failed completely, pretty much. At the end, he said, I don't know what I, uh, what I responded, pretty much. Um, uh, when we go into the violin world, there is also a, a certain literature which is giving us some kind of major dimensions uh, uh, what is going on pretty much when we listen to the sound of the violin. 
And uh, uh, we are talking about mm, mainly experiments that involve expert violin players. Uh, so people that have a certain number of years of music practice and listening, okay? Uh, in general, these people, violin players, uh, expert violin players, uh, tend to be, to have their own taste. So for example, and they are very consistent when they are asked about the quality of violins, they are usually very consistent in selecting what might be a good violin for them, okay? The funny, the funny thing, the, the reality is that, however, there is no uh, a systematic convergence among listeners. So, for example, if you take two violin players, expert ones, one might go for violin A and say that violin is the best violin he's listening to. The other might say is violin B. They always go for violin A, respectively, and violin B, uh, but they go their own taste. So everybody has a different taste. And... Uh, uh, mm, as you might know, there are not so many uh, papers, uh, sorry, sorry, so many articles or research on uh, historical violins, mainly because uh, the owners of this violin are very afraid of uh, uh, giving the violin for experiments or any type of uh, uh, test. And uh, if we uh, browse the few papers that have been uh, published and the few studies that have been done so far on uh, historical violins, what we know is that uh, if we give a bunch of new and old violins to expert uh, violin players, uh, uh, they tend, uh, these mm, mm, violin players tend to prefer new uh, uh, violins. And in general, the uh, Let's say, uh, or, uh, would you say, well, I don't know the, the word in English. Okay, the, the very famous name of Stradivari or Guarneri del, Ge del Gesù doesn't stand out uh, if you give these uh, violin players a violin to play and ask them, for example, uh, uh, to tell whether they are playing an historical violin or a new violin. So it seems that, uh, again, violin players seem to be uh, um, seems to know their own mind and go for a specific sound, which is in many cases uh, 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 represented by a, a new violin. And uh, uh, the very famous name of, uh, for example, Stradivari or Guarneri del Gesù doesn't seem to pop out when you just give a violin player a violin in his hand and ask him and ask the violinist to play the violin. Uh, and he doesn't seem able like to. Uh, recognize a glance or immediately that he's playing a very famous violin. I think we can um, move to the next slide. So what we did uh, was a double blind experiment. Uh, what does it mean double blind in our literature? It means that uh, I, I, uh, actually I was the one conducting the experiment. We were all together. There was me, Carlo, Massimo, and etc, cetera, etc. Cetera, but I was the one giving the pace to the experiment in the room. I didn't know the identity of the violin. Actually, I'm still curious because I, I know now the identity of the violin, but when I was into the room, I was not allowed to go closer than five meters to the violin. So I, I saw them in the table, like in the same background picture of Tao. So I could see them from a certain distance, but because unfortunately I'm not an expert on violins, I didn't know what I was looking at. So I could see some violins there but they didn't know the identity of the violins. I, I did not know the identity of the violins, nor the audience know the identity of the violins. They were never told, nor at the beginning, not at the end, the identity of the violins. Okay, uh, at the beginning, we just explained to the audience the uh, idea of the experiment. The idea of the experiment was fairly simple. We were playing a stimulus, a sound stimulus with the uh, reference violin X, which was a Stradivari but the audience didn't know that, followed by a second uh, uh, stimulus uh, with a comparison violin. And the audience was simply asked to compare the two sounds, the two stimuli, and judge uh, and compare them uh, along four dimensions that we will later see. Uh, we uh, uh, ran a familiar familiarization trial at the beginning of the test to explain how the test was going on, so playing these two uh, uh, stimuli one after the other. And then after we 
started the proper experiment. Uh, there were four blocks of trial. And uh, in each block of trial, uh, the listeners were evaluating 10 stimuli. Uh, the four in each of the four blocks, uh, the listeners were asked to judge a different dimension of the sound. Uh, here, there is no written, but in any case, uh, I can tell you in the first block of trials, listeners were asked to pay attention whether the comparison volume was more or less uh, apertura, open than the uh, um, uh, um, reference violin. In the second block of trial, it was asked whether the uh, comparison violin was more or less bright than the uh, reference violin. In the third block of trial, they were asked uh, apertura. Sorry, because I'm translating in Italian the, the objective. Oh, it's on the bottom, uh, Massimo. Ah, it's on the bottom, sorry. Yeah, here. Ah, sorry. Um, uh, the nasality of the sound, whether the, um, uh, the comparison violin was more or less nasal than the uh, reference violin. And finally, in the last block of trial, we asked them which uh, 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 of the two sounds were they preferred. Um, the two sounds that they were listening to, as Carlo uh, said at the beginning, was two simple scales. They were played on a on the first uh, string of the violin, if I remember well, Carlo, please correct me fourth, if I'm wrong. Fourth uh, the fourth uh, mm -hmm. string of the violin. Uh, we do not have any sample here to play them, just to give them a, a, a simple idea of a simple trial. Actually, uh, didn't include it in the presentation, but later on I will, maybe I can find it and uh, try to play back. Okay, so you can, uh, you can try to have a go and, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and judge by yourself. Uh, in uh, the experiment, sometimes uh, uh, one out of mm, five trials, uh, the reference violin was uh, the uh, comparison. Sorry, uh, the two. Uh, sorry, the two sounds that the listeners were listening to was actually both played by violin X, uh, and these were used like a control trial to understand whether it could understand a difference between a violin and itself. Okay. And um, after the two scales, so after they were listening to the first scale and then the second scale, they were asked to rate on a minus two, minus two to plus two scale, whether the second violin was more or less pleasant, nasal, open, clear than the first violin. I think we can move on. And these are the results. So in each graph, uh, these are called box plots. Um, they show not only like the average of the data, but also the distribution of the data. So on the x-axis of each uh, graph, there is the, uh, um, the letter that uh, tells you the uh, reference, uh, no, the comparison violin. Uh, so the second violin that they were listening to. Uh, on the y-axis, there is the uh, judgment uh, uh, of the participant, the evaluation of the participant. You can see uh, open on the top left, uh, brightness on the top right, uh, and nasality on the uh, bottom left, uh, and uh, pleasantness on the bottom right uh, group of box plots. Um, the horizontal dashed line along the zero means uh, uh, that the particular uh, violin, for example, was, uh, uh, um, is the reference point for the comparison violin, so the X violin. So for example, if we take uh, brightness, uh, the, uh, the second group of box plot, the top right graph, uh, and we judge the uh, uh, violet box plot and the violet data, which is actually the factory violin, the very cheap violin, uh, this, uh, um, the sound of this violin was judged uh, less bright in comparison to the reference violin X. Um, we could go through each individual graph, but I will uh, go in immediately um, to the most interesting one, which is the bottom, bottom right. Sorry. Sorry, sorry. Uh, which I, I mean, normally people are more interested in this graph, so pleasantness. 
So if you see in comparison to the reference violin X, violin B was judged like the most pleasant timber, okay? Followed by violin uh, C, which is the modern violin 1917, followed again by uh, um, violin A, which was judged less pleasant than the standard. And as you can see, uh, the worst, uh, the less uh, the least pleasant sound was that of violin D, which was the factory sound, uh, the, uh, the factory violin. Now maybe we can move on. Okay. Uh, um, um, if you were comparing the box plot, for example, the last uh, graph I was showing you, you could see that the boxes of the box plot, which show the majority of the distribution, were uh, quite well separated one from the other. Uh, and, and this is uh, 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 um, something that suggests to you that actually uh, judgments by listeners were uh, quite well separated one from the other. So, for example, uh, if you look at uh, pleasantness, so the four box plot on the bottom right uh, part of the graph, uh, you can see that the green box is uh, 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 something like a... Um, I mean, uh, quite not overlapping with the, uh, the, the other green box plot uh, uh, that is produced by the data of the violin C. And this means that uh, the two uh, violins were actually uh, judged different, but um, consistently different in the sense that uh, there was not much overlap in the judgment. So I think now we can uh, go on. Um, yes, we also tested the reliability of uh, our participants, how we tested the reliability of our participants. Um, but first of all, we had more uh, than one trial uh, in which the comparison violin was played. So for example, the comparison, comparison violin B was played um, twice in each block of trial. And uh, we uh, checked whether the participant was always giving the same answer to the same stimulus. So whether in practice, when he was listening to the same violin B, uh, he was returning to us always the same answer. Uh, another thing that we checked is whether the participant was uh, giving no difference again in the, when he was listening to the uh, violin X played twice. So if you remember, I told you in some of the trials, participants were listening twice to the uh, same violin. And these were, were for us kind of control trials to check whether the participants were able to discriminate or not these two identical sounds, okay? And uh, we combined these two indexes uh, um, in a kind of statistical way to obtain a kind of index, reliability index of uh, each participant now no, do not go so much into the uh, detail, but uh, um, I don't know, there, there is no like a summary statistics here, or maybe it's this one in our, yeah. Uh, the, in the majority of cases, uh, our participants were reliable in the sense that when they were listening twice to the same violin, they were giving, a, uh, they were telling us that the, the two sounds were not different. And when they were listening, for example, the same violin, over the experiment, they were always giving the same answer, uh, except, except for a very small number of participants. Uh, so if I remember well, Carlo was something like within 10 participants, something like this. I don't yes. remember now. Um, uh, 60 participants out of 70, pretty much, I might be wrong about the exact number, were absolutely reliable uh, during all the duration of the experiment. I think we can also go on. We um, also calculated a uh, kind of li uh, linear model. So um, we calculated the statistics uh, again. So I'm, I'm sorry, uh, I don't know whether I'm going to be too technical or too trivial. So please, uh, uh, I apologize in advance whether I'm either too technical or too trivial. But in any case, we uh, put into a statistical equation the ratings of our participants and uh, uh, try to see uh, which was like, say, the timber recipe 
uh, that was making a pleasant sound. So participants at some point was, uh, were giving us uh, judgments about the pleasantness of sound, but they were also giving us uh, judgments about the nasality, uh, the brightness of the sound, or whether the sound was open or closed, okay? So we, uh, um, uh, with the statistical model, we try to understand which was like, let's say the mathematical recipe to come out with a pleasant sound, whether for example, to have a pleasant sound, you needed to have more or less uh, nasality, more or less brightness, or more or less uh, openness in the sound. And this is the, uh, the equation that comes out. Uh, please uh, 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 do uh, not listen to my words by heart in the sense that it is not a recipe. Uh, um, uh, and uh, uh, actually this linear equation uh, is just suggesting uh, something about what might be a pleasant sound. So if you see, uh, pleasantness uh, is uh, directly correlated with the openness of the sound, uh, the brightness of the sound, 0.15, and in general, uh, uh, pleasantness is negatively correlated with the nasality of the sound. So uh, nasality doesn't seem like a good property of the timbre of the violin, in the sense that it doesn't contribute positively to, the, to a pleasant sound. But I would rather skip this in the sense that really, uh, this is not like the recipe to obtain a pleasant sound. So I think we can carry on. Uh, yeah, uh, so, so um, in general, uh, just to conclude this psychological part, uh, our participants were uh, a very reliable group of participants, very consistent. They were giving us very solid, some solid responses. And uh, this was demonstrated by uh, um, several of the analyses where we performed. And secondly, uh, maybe also because of this reason, uh, we could come out uh, with that linear equation that was explaining uh, a quite a fairly large percentage of our results. So I think now I can leave uh, uh, the uh, word to Carlo. Yeah, thank you. So uh, probably you already have a lot of questions about this part, but um, uh, I think we decided to postpone them to the end, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's, okay. yeah. Well, so, plenty of time for questions later. Yeah, I will now, I think I have still some time to describe a little bit the physical part of the of this experiment, because as I said, we were aiming at finding also some uh, uh, relationship between these preferences that were that emerged from the listening experiment and the physical properties of the instruments. Now I report here a few numbers for you and uh, as makers, you are much more used than me to evaluate them. Uh, this is the distribution of the masses. So the masses of uh, all the violins and the masses here were, the violins were weighted uh, with, uh, um, I mean, uh, mounted with all the accessories except the chin arrest because the violin uh, player didn't use it for, for them. So this is the weight with the uh, strings, uh, everything except the chin rest. And uh, I think these are pretty standard uh, measurements uh, for, for these weights. Uh, I noticed that the two Stradivari violin have exactly the same weight. And uh, the two modern instruments are the extreme ones. Uh, so the ancient one was very heavy or very, it was quite heavy. And uh, the modern one was lighter. I don't know if it, this lights, uh, uh, so some, some light uh, in your mind, but uh, this, uh, this is just a, a, a short representation of the, of the sizes. So on the horizontal axis is the, the area, so basically, and not not the actual area, but the rectangular approximation of the area. So it tells you how wide, how large the, the surface of the violin is. And uh, you see C violin, the modern one, which is curiously the heaviest, is also the smaller. While the other ones are kind of uh, in a more standard, uh, come in a more standard size. Here on the vertical axis is the uh, aspect ratio, so length, uh, over uh, width of the body of the violin. And again, there are some differences 
uh, probably less uh, important than the others, but violin A and X uh, are kind of uh, weaker violin while uh, C, B and uh, the, the factory violin is the thinner one, so the longer one. We measured, uh, I would say here in a very, so in, in a very informal way with the, using the looking meter, uh, the, the speed of sound on the violins. So of course, uh, we were not allowed to perform very accurate measurements there, but also here, I think you can immediately, uh, so there is a bell ringing in here immediately. So you see these are, are the uh, speed of sound along the, the grain in the top blue and bottom of the violins. And of course, you immediately spot that the factory violin has a quite low uh, figure for this number. The other violins are pretty much in line. So I would say from the point of view of the material of which the, 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 the top is made of, these violins are kind of okay, while this one is clearly defective somehow or not up to, this, to the modern standard. These are the same numbers for the uh, for the uh, speed across grain. Uh, I don't know exactly what this tells me, but in any case, if you calculate the ratio between the two, so long, uh, let's say, a speed of sound along over speed of sound across, you get this uh, ratios. And uh, in this case, you see again the violin D, which is the least preferred, uh, has a very low ratio, uh, while the the violin A, which is the second uh, to least preferred, is uh, the, the has the the, the uh, lower uh, lower ratio except for D, and all the other three violins have uh, uh, quite uh, uh, equal ratio. Now, a, a word of warning here. So, in the part of the experiment that Massimo described, the listening experiment, we have a very solid statistics because there were more than uh, fourteen hundred. Uh, uh, listening overall. So if you multiply all the listening by all the violins, by all the, 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 the tests, while here we are only reasoning on a, on a set of four measurements. So uh, I'm reporting this to you because uh, this is what we found, but clearly we cannot be really predictive or we cannot be sure that this association, because looking at this, this plot alone, one would be tempted to say, okay, good, I found the holy grail. Now the, uh, this, this ratio is just the, the, the indicator of the preference for the violin. No, no it's, it doesn't work like that because of course we are, uh, we, here we are only reasoning on, on four instruments. So I can report if I spot something interesting, but uh, there is no statistical association between the, the, the data and the, these measurements. We um, we didn't plan initially to to perform sound analysis, but then we we uh, thought that it was better to check that one violin was not significantly louder than the others because from the literature we know that if a violin is louder, then it's all, almost very likely it will be preferred the preferred one, and uh, this tells a lot about uh, how careful one must be when evaluating timbre. So one thinks he is evaluating timbre, but instead is, is actually evaluating the loudness of a violin sometimes if you don't perform the, the experiment carefully. So again, in this box plot representation on the horizontal axis, all the violins, A, B, C, D, X, and uh, on the vertical axis, some um, rough measurements of the, not of the loudness, but it's the root mean square amplitude of this, of the recorded sound. It's not exactly the same thing, but let's say it's an indicator that at least the source was not uh, exceedingly different. And as you can see, the only violin which is uh, a little bit louder than the other is violin C, which is however, not the preferred one. The preferred one was B. C was actually rated the same exact as X and A was rated uh, less than all and, and D was the least uh, preferred violin. So there is clearly no association here. Very, there was no single violin which was uh, significantly louder and in, in any case it was not the preferred one. It's also interesting to see what happens if we look at the, at the sound intensity, let's call it like this, note by note on each violin. And uh, you will immediately see that there is much more difference uh, between different notes on each violin 
then uh, on the average uh, sound emitted, uh, so more difference between violin than within violins. And the reason is that uh, in the scale that we use from, from uh, uh, G to D, uh, this scale is actually crossing the, the Helmholtz resonance, which is this, this peak here. So the, the note, the, D, the uh, C note or uh, C note is clearly always louder than the others because it's in the middle of this Helmholtz resonance. However, again, notice how different violins can be even, even playing few notes. Violin B, the, Stradi, the preferred Stradivari, has this huge uh, difference between the, the loudest and the least uh, uh, and the softest note. Uh, so if you listen to it, when you're crossing the speaker, you, you really uh, have a strong impression out of it. Violin C, on the other, uh, uh, on the other hand, it was carefully uh, registered, and so it's quite even. So the, the, this resonance is not... Uh, 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 very prominent. So the violins emit an average comparable level of sound pressure. The level uh, difference between the notes on each violin are larger than the average between violins. And the timbre is therefore not correlated with loudness in our experiment. Then, uh, okay, I think I have kind of 10 minutes uh, and uh, I will uh, uh, show you the um, uh, uh, results of the measurements performed by the people in Politecnico. They measure both sound radiation and bridge mobility with the method that you are all familiar with of the impact uh, hammer. So the difference being that in bridge mobility, you actually put an accelerometer here and measure uh, how much the bridge moves at each frequency, roughly said. While in the sound radiation, you still use the impact timer, but then you record the sound with a microphone, which is close by the violin, so the, 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 the near field sound, and uh, you plot the, actually the acoustic response of the instrument to the, to the hammer, hammering. Now these two plots give you usually different and complementary information. For instance, uh, the very important uh, information about the Helmholtz resonance, which is here, uh, often disappears in the in the bridge mobility because of course you're you're not measuring the air you're measuring the bridge while here it's it is very clear uh, on the other hand for instance uh, you have not so clear or maybe i'm not so expert in judging this but to me it's not clear to spot the so-called uh, uh, bridge hill which is instead a clear feature of the bridge mobility. So all the violins have this, uh, let's say, broadband peak, which is supposed, and we, we find in the literature, I think uh, uh, Professor Hudaus is the expert on this one, and uh, uh, it is known somehow to be related to, to, it, to, be, to be, let's say, a quality uh, parameter for the, for, the, for the instruments. So you get different information. For instance, from this plot, clearly you see that violin B which is in fact the preferred one, sticks out by far from uh, with respect to the other instrument in this area, in, in I would say in a rather unusual way. Um, on the other hand, if you look, for instance, at the Helmholtz resonance, again, violin B is prominent, but on the other hand, there is no this wide difference between all the other violins here. Actually, one should be careful because in, in uh, dB scale, even small differences might sound uh, large, but, but maybe I will, I will be back on this again. There are other features here. Uh, anyway, if you look at these graphs, uh, what I find usually confusing is that it's very hard to follow them peak by peak and uh, making a rational. This is also why in the literature, people tended to to, uh, let's say, imagine theories out of those. Uh, this is a magnification of, of, the, of the first body resonance of the violin. Again, you see uh, what I said about the Helmholtz. And uh, again, there are, we can, we can discuss, I think, for hours about the, the, the tiny differences in, in this, in this, in the location and amplitude of these resonances. But look now, I try to, uh, um, is still a theory out of these numbers. And of course, I'm doomed to fail because with only, again, with only four violins, I don't know if I'm right or I'm wrong. But for instance, uh, 
Uh, I read in some paper that uh, the, the mode, uh, the amplitude of the A0 mode uh, is the only quality parameter for a violin. Well, this might seem to be true for the preferred violin, which has the, the largest amplitude, but then you see violin D is not so bad. So um, its amplitude is, is actually the second largest among all. So it's not, but, but violin D was the least preferred. So that's not true that amplitude alone can explain pleasantness. Frequency, I don't know. There is a little bit of variability in the frequency of these violins. And in fact, uh, D and B are kind of extreme, but I've not found in the literature, uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, uh, theories uh, claiming that the frequency of a mode is a quality parameter. Other theories, I've read, for instance, uh, B, the difference uh, between B1, uh, so the average of the B frequencies and uh, uh, a, a zero frequency is a, is a quality parameters. Again, it's questionable because violin B again sticks out on the left, but violin D is in the middle, so it's not on the right. Or another theory says that B1 plus minus B1 minus is again a quality parameter. And again, you see it, it's so. Just a warning, I'm not claiming that either of this theory is right or wrong. I'm just claiming that you can't just extract any theory from just uh, episodical uh, um, observations. Um, what we did, uh, just uh, we tried to simplify a little bit the, the examination of those uh, um, sound radiation plot. And in order to do that, we just uh, smoothed them out in uh, bands which roughly uh, mimic uh, what is the uh, what happens in your ear when you perceive the sound you you don't pick up uh, all the all the frequencies individually but instead the ear is working in bands so these bands are kind of um, giving you the rough representation that your ear might extract out of the actual responses of the instrument now, as you can see, for instance, there is a, a problem in sampling here because some violins are better sampled. So some, some resonances, sorry, are better sampled on some violins than in other with the particular choice of the note that we, that we had. Uh, but we chose those few notes just to simplify the experiment. Otherwise, play, so the more notes you play, the longer the experiment is and the more complex is the evaluation. And since timbre memory is quite short, uh, after a few, I think, seconds is gone, uh, or a few tens of seconds is gone. So you have to really be quick to perform the experiments properly. Anyway, again, a warning that some points might be better sampled than others. Um, when you compare here the, the these uh, red uh, lines, which are the smoothed out version of the uh, sound radiation, Indeed, you can, it's easier to spot differences. As I said, for instance, this violin B, who actually had this extraordinary uh, bridge hill. Now you can also see that it has quite a, 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 a strong response in, in, uh, in this band around 2000 uh, of Hertz. Um, violin D, let's, let's look at the, at the worst violin because I think it's more, sometimes it's more instructive to look at bad violins than uh, good violins. First of all, because they are easier to spot. And uh, second, because if there is a clear defect, you might even uh, spot uh, it easily. So the association between the uh, sound radiation and the, and the manufacture of the violin might be easier. So here you can, or at least I can immediately tell what's the pro what the problem is. We saw that the, that the wood was bad. And now here we see what causes this bad choice of wood. So uh, this, this violin has a strong response in this area and not in the other. So the black line is the reference violin, the X violin. So uh, what I would expect is, is this violin will sound as if I have narrow past it, the, the actual sound. So it's responding very strongly in this middle frequency range and not much in low frequency and high frequency ranges. So uh, in my head, this is exactly the definition of, of a nasal or closed sound. And again, um, I don't claim this as anything universal here, but uh, in this case, at least, this is what I would have said just by looking at this. Uh, uh, traces here, not uh, knowing the result of the listening experiment. 
Uh, so some differences between the instruments are clear looking at the impulse response analysis. Um, impulse response actually tells you only something about the steady state response of the instrument. So there is no time variable, no, there is only frequency variable. And this is a tricky point because we know that uh, perception of timbre is actually very heavily related to also temporal feature of sound. So the question here arises whether is, it's, it's uh, uh, at all possible to uh, uh, draw conclusions by looking at uh, impulse response alone. Anyway, on the other hand, I would say that since this is the single uh, most well known and most uh, uh, well spread around method in the hands of violin maker, well, it's always worth it to, to try examining the, the results. So predicted timber from, uh, from uh, frequency response function uh, is still uh, not uh, uh, possible, at least uh, in our experiment, uh, uh, but something can be learned, I think. Uh, very, very last word before leaving the conclusion to Massimo. Uh, going back to the experience in the school, uh, we thought that this could actually be used as a um, teaching method. So uh, how, how is the idea of good sound is formed? Is it an uh, innate idea or does it depend on your culture? I think that the big role is played by the, your master. So your master will tell you this is good violin and, or the community or, or anyway, there is an interplay between uh, these two. And uh, building up a good ear is, is part of the training of the maker, not only of a musician. So I think performing this kind of test in a school environment could also be uh, relevant because for instance, this is an example of an, in, an individual um, record. So the dots, uh, the red dots are the individual responses of this particular individual. And they're plotted over the general uh, responses of all. And you can see, you know, sometimes this individual actually, uh, quite often actually I would say, he responded uh, uh, twice uh, on average uh, with the same mar marks, but some other times he gave different ratings. And so you can not only learn to be consistent, but also you can learn what is your uh, perception of sound with respect to the perception of other people, which is also very important. If uh, everybody stuck with my perception is the right perception, that is not going to work because it's not reproducible in any experiment. Um, yeah, Massimo, if you want to say a few remarks, I think we fit to stay in one hour, so I'm, I can- uh, Tablo, but if you want, you can carry on to the end and then maybe we can collect the questions together. Okay, okay. Then I will just read this conclusion not to be too uh, annoying to the audience. So, so uh, we had an experiment which involved a very uh, boring stimulus, um, um, which was chosen on purpose. And despite the small range of notes played and the lack of expression and the lack of context, uh, musical context, uh, uh, people were able actually to discriminate uh, Ferrari from, from Cinquecento and in a very consistent way. So uh, this, this method can be used, uh, the last thing I said is uh, as diagnostic or educational tool. Uh, the listener is forced to focus on a specific aspect of sound once, one at a time. So remember in the experiment, we had separate blocks of listening and in each block, people were only focused to listening at one aspect of timbre, not all of them together mixed. Um, so there is no effect of the performance in these results. I'm pretty confident about that. And uh, the most re reliable listener can be selected somehow automatically from the experiment because as, as Massimo explained, you have a way to, uh, to double check the consistency and the re reliability of the listeners uh, after, after the experiment has ended. So you can uh, decide, you can throw some away or you can uh, keep some other. And uh, uh, I, I briefly mentioned this in the beginning. This is not so much correlated with, uh, with experience. So a little bit, yes. Uh, I don't have a plot here for this here to show, but um, yes, there is, uh, so experienced makers are rated uh, slightly better than inexperienced ones. But overall, I think uh, it is most a uh, matter of 
the moment uh, maybe the, the 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 attention keeping the attention for long enough if you are just distracted for a second then you might rate it uh, badly uh, the method does not require complex apparatus but it is uh, uh, it must perform the right way so in a rigorous way there are a lot of subtleties to take care and comparing sound radiation from impulse or response may not be conclusive but some clues with with I think at least we found some clues. Let me think uh, people in uh, municipal municipality of Cremona, the mayor and uh, Chiara Bondioni, the director of this section, people in Museo uh, del Violino, the, the uh, Fausto, you, most of you know him, and the director of museum, director of the violin making school and the violinist and everybody. And thank you for your attention. I think I'm done with this. Probably right. um, I could make a try to play the sample if you can hear it. Uh, oh, okay, you want to try now. that? Yeah, try that now. Can you hear it? So I hope you hear it. Uh, this was pretty much a live extract from the from the test. Uh, uh, we we could actually have done a, a live poll here to 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 rate this violence. I have my clear preference in this case. I don't know about you. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Let's give them a round of applause. And. Thank you. Um, if you have questions, please use the uh, raise hand function in, in Zoom. And if you can't find it, you can always type a question into the chat and we'll eventually get to it. All right. All right, um, Joseph, you're first up. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for the, um, the presentation. And it was wonderful to see this work being done in, in Cremona. And, um, I, I was very interested by the way you organize the experiment. Um, now, I have one methodologi methodological question. How confident are you that if you use different reference file in, you'd get the same results? Uh, because there's no particular reason to believe that if you, that that should be true. Massimo, would you like to? Um, of course. Uh, I have not the empirical answer in the sense that we didn't run the experiment with a different reference violin. Well, I can tell you that, for example, for many dimensions, like, for example, brightness, open nasality, even pleasantness somehow, I think, uh, although we are talking about timbre, so we are talking about a, a multidimensional property or perceptual property, something like this. Uh, 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 these types of properties tend to be fairly simple. So it's fairly simple to judge whether one sound is brighter than another one, or more pleasant than, uh, pleasant than another one, for example, with this uh, very simple stimuli and so on. So, um, I mean, I, I wouldn't bet like my money on, on it, but definitely I would say that if we were replacing the reference violins, perhaps uh, we would obtain the same results, of course, is also, also, uh, also this time we were also kind of lucky in the sense that the reference by Linux was just pretty much in the middle of each scale. So it was not an extreme violin, for example. I think that, for example, if we were, uh, it was, the, the, the reference by Linux was selected randomly before the experiment. If we were selecting, for example, violin, uh, which is the bad violin, Carlo? D, no. Yeah, if we were selecting violin mm. D, for example, uh, so an extreme uh, violin in many timbre characteristics, perhaps the results would have been very different. But just because the uh, the violin itself was very extreme uh, in the timbre qualities, it was very nasal, uh, not very pleasant, and blah, blah, blah. May I also add something? Uh, so I think uh, 
Yeah, as Massimo said, we don't have an empirical answer to this question. So what I ex would expect, I would expect that is if I uh, choose as a reference an extreme sounding violin, somehow the rating will be kind of compressed because assuming that, for instance, let's, uh, let's uh, uh, speak out loud. Violin D, uh, when we tested it in the school, so informally, but it always resulted as the worst violin. No? Uh, and in the school, uh, we didn't perform the experiment this well and this with this all attention, but we had a lot of set uh, of, uh, of instrument changing there. And this was constantly judged as a bad violin. So I don't really expect that changing the reference will screw up the, the, the order, if, if we, if it, if, if, even though I cannot prove it. Probably it will change the sensitivity of the ratings, because of course, if, you are, if your uh, reference is extreme, all the other marks will probably be compressed. But anyway, it will be very interesting to reperform the experiment changes, mm -hmm. switching the, 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 the reference. Okay, so you 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 will acknowledge though that to get a ranked ranking instruments from this kind of comparison would be considered problematic statistically. Uh, uh, could you please repeat it? Did you understand the beginning of the question? Um, would you agree though that um, trying to get rankings like A is better than B, B is better than C from when you're not actually comparing them with each other? Is, is questionable. It might be questionable. Uh, it might be questionable. Uh, to be honest, with such a small set of instruments, uh, it might not also, uh, hmm. in the sense that uh, ranking can be done. Uh, of course, if you extend the number of violins and so on, things become more difficult. I agree, for example. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure that um, uh, so let's say, let, let's, let's put it like this, uh, clearly, so rigorously taken the experiment only tests uh, sound of violence with, with a reference, with respect to a reference. That's it. That's what the experiment rigorously prove. And, uh, I think it's not just meta. So this is not the detail in this experiment. So fixing a reference is important in judging timber. Uh, if you aim at, uh, at um, uh, ranking violence on an absolute scale, I think this is quickly becomes an ill-defined Ill problem. So maybe the results would change, maybe not, probably with few violins uh, like those, probably they won't change much. But is actually that what you want to do? Uh, I think it's more uh, important to, to have a reference. So for instance, uh, if you, I don't know if you noticed, but the easiest comparison is probably between the two uh, G notes because they are the last and the first that are played. And if I play again the sample, you immediately spot the difference between the two. I doubt that if I switch the, the, the order, which amounts in switching the reference, you will change your mind. But in any case, the, having a reference is important. This is my opinion. Eh? <laughs> Okay, I, I bring this up because I, I, I know in um, papers I've worked on with, with Claudia and Fan, um, it's the sort of thing reviewers will go after. Oh, no, 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 you can't do that. Um, and I think you acknowledged that in your paper, your written paper, yeah, but you yeah, had brought it up here. So I was I would just wanted to get that we, out. We agree. Okay. Uh, but as Carlos said, to be honest, uh, uh, for listeners having a comparison uh, was definitely comfortable, let's say, in the sense that the judgment uh, uh, was much easier. I mean, uh, judging timber on an absolute basis, uh, even with a small set of instruments, uh, can be tricky. I mean, in my opinion, uh, uh, I'm not a violin timber expert. So, um, of course, as I said at the beginning, also in our introduction, uh, uh, here we have a world of expert in violin sound and a world of non-expert, and I belong to the non-expert world, okay? But uh, judging timber on an absolute basis, like, uh, uh, I mean, comparing timbers on an absolute basis can be tricky, I mean, in my opinion. Uh, our listeners did find it comfortable to have a reference violin to compare with. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, think it's, I think it's a great method. I really love it, I, which makes me just want to get to the bottom of 
what can we then do with the results? Because I completely agree that it's, it's a great way of teaching, a great way of demonstrating, but um, I don't understand statistics well enough to, um, so I'll, I'll just turn it over to, uh, um, I think Jim was next, but thank you again. Go ahead, Jim. So this is <clears throat> this is more of a comment than a question. I th this, uh, thanks for the talk. It's a it's an interesting study and very very neat and clear. The the, the usual uh, difficulty to draw clear conclusions. Um, I'm uh, hoping that you're going to do more of this kind of thing. And so here's a suggestion. There are two things that I would be really interested to try following on just exactly where you've started. The first one is easy, which is that if you repeat the exact same listening test, but you use recordings rather than the live performance, can people still do it? And do you get the same answer? Uh, the more tricky one, but would be very revealing. Uh, you, you've probably seen the work we did some years ago with Claudia, with what we called virtual violins, where we took, now you've got the physical measurement of the, the admittance and the sound radiation. You could take a single recording of the string signal from playing that scale on the G string, and you could synthesize using your physical measurements uh, a kind of version of the sound um, with the five different um, <clears throat> bridge responses. And it would be very interesting. I, I would be extremely interested in whether those two stages, whether people can still form the judgments. If so, do they give the same ranking or do some qualities disappear, but others survive? You, you, you see what I mean? You, you, you've got a, a methodology, you've justified that very neatly and yet you could you could capitalize on that now i know how long these tests take to do it's easy to say why don't you just do another test but, <laughs> but um maybe next year's bunch of students also need training um it would be very interesting to do and if you've got recordings of the whole thing because of, of, and of course you need more than one recording of the scale on each instrument so that the the catch trials and not actually the identical recording, but they're two different performances on the same instrument. But I think those would both be interesting questions. The first one is about how much can you capture in recordings and, and hi-fi and all that, which is interesting in its own right. And the second one is more physics-y. That, that, that's one way of addressing the question, how much of this difference do we capture in some sense by the physical measurements you've talked about? And by turning it back into sound, can people still hear the same things? So that's that's it. Yeah, uh, actually, thanks for the comments. So th those are exactly the next two steps we had in mind. <laughs> 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 so um, I can uh, well, I can also comment on um, uh, on the recording. So as I said, initially we we didn't think about this. It, it happened like more by chance that we decided, oh, okay, let's uh, let's record the trial just to be, just maybe a bit useful in the future. And um, I did the two sets of recording. One was live during the trial and the second one was uh, in another occasion, just a different occasion. And there, my feeling is that we really need an expert in uh, audio recording because moving the microphone here and there a little bit, even just a little bit, can really alter your parameters. The recordings were made live, so in this uh, uh, reverberant uh, environment. And uh, it Because that's also, also a, that, that's an interesting question in its own right. Yeah, if exactly. If people can tell from recordings, can you fool them? Exactly. I mean, recording engineers would be an interesting subset of test people exactly i mean in, indeed you could set a recording engineer to say can you compensate for these differences can you make yeah, these all exactly. sound great if so what did you have to do to make them sound great that's a another interesting question exactly so in, in this case i tell you what i'm expecting so again if i band pass the good violin it will become nasal and close this is what i'm expe expecting without uh, uh well, more interesting question is what I have, do I have to do to the bad violin to make it sound good? Yeah. 
All right, uh, Martin. Yes, uh, thank you for the great work you have done. Uh, it's also more a comment rather than a, a question. I wonder how the results would have been or how they would be if you had chosen rather a, um, a short piece of music instead of a technical scale. Um, something like 15 seconds, Bach sonata, a pass scale or on the G string, because my experience would be it's very difficult to judge the instrument by scales. And because uh, playing a scale is, is rather a technical exercise and playing something like a short piece of music creates more an emotional effect in the instrument, of course. The goal of the, goal of, of the instrument is emotion. And so you need to, um, to to wake people up to get certain emotions when they listen to the instrument, I would say. So um, it's rather people in my workshop, they say, or they, they, they show if they are touched by the sound personally, if it's emotionally, if they are touched, if they say, well, this is my voice or something like this, they would never say it's my voice playing a technical scale. They, they, it would be imp impossible for them to judge an instrument from a technical, from a just from four semitones. They need to play music. So I always ask them play music, and I even ask them do not only judge the instrument by what you hear, but much more by what you feel and how you feel after you play the instrument. So did it create emotion when you played the instrument? And you need music. I would say you need music not scales. Uh, I reply. Uh, thank you for the comment. Uh, the reason why we selected uh, scales and not music is that we thought about a possible interaction between the timbre of the specific violin and the specific piece of music that was played by the violinist. So um, again, I repeat, I'm not an expert in the violin world here, but Carlo was suggesting me and also that some violins are better to play some style or some pieces of music than some other ones. So let's say in this sense, the scale was neutral. I totally agree with you. That was uh, uh, absolutely absent of emotion. <laughs> you know, there was no, no, no any feeling emerging from the sound, but it's, in the very end, this is exactly what we wanted to. So uh, uh, having like exactly this type of experiment and the scale was exactly for uh, used for this purpose. Yeah, I can also add something. So this is clearly a kind of debate that will can go on forever because uh, and as I said in the beginning, when we we proposed to to make us to judge scaling by scales, they all said what you said just said now. Um, no, it's impossible. So, so I think uh, we we proved that it is possible actually. And of course, you don't have to take it as a um, overall evaluation of the violin. It's a very specific and. The difficulty, I think, in in pushing uh, forward the science uh, in music is exactly that. So you have to match the need for uh, get uh, so for for finding something that is useful to explain your feeling. But on the other hand, you have to 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 measure something, and in order to measure some, something, you have to be very specific, very boring sometimes. So. There is a let's say a trade-off between these two these yeah, two as aspects. Can I add something? Okay, no, I just wanted to add one more thing mm -hmm. uh, uh, under this respect. So clearly, if you play um, um, a, a song, let's say uh, an excerpt of a musical piece, not only the listener are affected emotionally, but also the player will be. So in some sense, he will also interact with the violin in an emotional way. And you know that the whole point of, of violin being expressed is that the player can affect in a thousand sub, very subtle way the performance. So as a, as a violin player, of course, I don't care about scales uh, uh, in a listening test, but uh, as, a scient as a scientist, uh, I'm very, very afraid that even the subtler, uh, the subtlest displays of a note, a slight vibrato here and there, maybe the finger is slightly different, because the, the violinist is adapting to the to the violin, uh, will somehow affect the the trial. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. Well, to, to state your uh, metaphor with the car, I would say, of course, you need to get a feeling how does it react when I go into a curve or when I go faster. So I need to drive. Otherwise, I don't understand what is a car. You need to drive. And so I would say, judging the violin, you need to try how does it react, G-string on, if you play Cesar Frank Sinatra or Sibelius, the, the passage on, what does the G, can I dig, can I really go deep into the G-string when I play this? What happens when I play the, the first notes of Mozart? How does it respond? Because playing Mozart, you cannot do anything. You just have to trust the violin. You, you, you hear the violin. What does it happen to the violin when you play Bach? So you need to, to, you need to, to check the instrument by what it's meant to do, creating emotions. Uh, yeah, so I, 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 don't trust, I don't trust this kind of technical proving an instrument. So yeah, yeah. I understand. I, ma'am, I just want to add uh, like an anecdote. I, I used to play when I was very young. I had uh, so the, the owner of the Bisolotti father violins landed his violins to, to people to play, to keep it alive. And um, I had this violin and I remember it, it sounded very loud and very, it was very, had a very strong uh, and immediate response. And uh, later on, I, I, uh, the owners wanted it back and I had another violin who had uh, what I would define my own uh, vision of, uh, of a nice timbre, but it was much louder and much softer. Now, if you're playing music, how do you quantify which is best? You can't, because if you're playing as a solo in Tchaikovsky's concert, of course, the first violin will be best because you have to overwhelm somehow the orchestra. But if you're playing a quart, a Haydn's quartet, you want to blend in. So if your violin is sticking out too much, maybe it's not the best choice for this repertoire. So this just to add more complexity to the discussion. All right, thank, thank you, Martin. Uh, Jonas? Yeah, so um, thanks for the talk. I thought it was super interesting to see how how you can like that you show that even with a very restricted tone material that you can that people can actually consistently rank violins along these different uh, coordinates and so I think that's a re- really neat result. So my my question is about the relating the the descriptors the three descriptors you have with the pleasantness scale like this uh, linear model you try to to make. So I was just wondering like to me at least these words like openness, nasality, and uh, clarity, they are already sort of uh, loaded somehow. Like they already have some kind of, of quality uh, stamp built into them, right? Nobody would say that a closed and nasal violin is better than an open and uh, not so nasal one, right? So I was just thinking, like, wondering, have you considered using uh, descriptors that are less uh, in lack of a better word, loaded than, than, than the ones you used for this experiment. Yeah, um, and can I also add to that, which is, you know, how did you um, end up with those specific three, you know, descriptors? Yeah, okay, the story was this one. So we started with a larger number of descriptors. Uh, and for instance, I don't remember that order. I think uh, Alessandro is here in the audience, so maybe he remembers better than me. But I think there was uh, something else like uh, metallic, uh, wooden-like sound. uh, And uh, well, there were a few more. Now, um, again, you have to trade off between how complex the test is and uh, how significant the results are. So we ended selecting this few to fit the whole test in like one hour. Otherwise, if you take it longer, people will be exhausted and it will be impossible to get any, any result. And we basically selected that one that we saw were kind of more reliable. But I have to say, you, you said a very interesting thing. So I agree with you that if you ask people, well, an open and uh, so a closed and nasal sound will be bad. No, and, and these are low, obvious. But remember that in this case, they were rated independently. 
So people didn't know which was the nasal violin on the second trial. They were all scrambled. So we have a demonstration that this kind of uh, loading is, uh, is not cultural. It, it occurs by, by pure listening. So there was, if I ask people, rate in, in a row, uh, what is your preferred sound? And if it's nasal or not, I'm pretty sure this, there will be a correlation induced by the fact that you know they are loaded. But in the experiment, this emerged by, by independent observation. So I was pretty satisfied to see that actually common sense can be uh, recovered in a way, even if it's common sense. The choice of the scriptors is tough. Uh, as I mentioned, there are a few papers also from Claudia, Fritz, and, uh, but, but also from other groups. And the number of the scriptors is huge. Um, I think they also express like the aesthetics of some community. Maybe this uh, became common because uh, people here are more used to them. And uh, uh, the other example is, is for wine tasting. Yeah. No, I don't know if any of you took part in a wine tasting. I didn't. So I'm not a very, very fond of wine. But uh, a friend of mine presented me with a, 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 a form that uh, they used to fill when rating wines. And most of those descriptors are, are totally uh, unknown to me. I wouldn't. I have no clue what they mean. So what does it mean that the wine is harmonic or uh, uh, solid or I don't know as it is descriptive. So you really make your own uh, uh, meaning out of, of your experience. So I think that getting the feedback from the community of what are the, the relevant descriptive for them is important. I don't know if you agree Massimo on this. We, we discussed a little bit. I, I I definitely agree with Carlo, but uh, I think also the we have to with the, we have, how do you deal with the question on the chat? Do you have to read them aloud or something? Yeah, we'll we'll we'll, we'll, um, we'll, we'll get to them or do, or if, feel free to, if you want to respond to one that we have. You know, I haven't gotten to the uh, the chat questions yet. Uh, okay, so you know, just just to respond to everybody, did the player have a preference? Uh, I don't know. Uh, actually, uh, the player is the player. Please, Carlo, correct me if I'm wrong. The player that is one of the players that is usually um, um, that is also working for the museum. Is that correct, Carlo? Uh, Eduardo it's was not uh, working the, for the museum, but is a usual. Is one of the people who usually uh, interact with the museum. So, and, um, yeah, yeah. Please go on. But, but I don't know whether he could express any, any preference uh, uh, with the uh, scale, with the scale that is unfortunately was forced to play for something like 40 minutes. Um, uh, uh, um, there is another question about using synthesized uh, synthetic sound. Yes, this would be also another possible step. And um, let me see. Uh, sorry, I, I missed this question by John Bean. Could by choosing a professional violinist, the violinist can improve could I, the tone. Could I just add a comment on the synthesized sound? Um, don't even try it. It's a non-starter. Uh, purely <laughs> synthesized sounds. We tried it. The, we even managed to publish a paper which more or less says we tried this and it didn't work. So then we tried that and it still didn't work and it got it through the reviewers, but we, this was about vibrato, but whenever we did something which didn't use real string playing as input, but used synthesized input, basically all the musical listeners said, I don't like any of them, they're all horrible. Doesn't sound like a violin at all. So um, we do not have good enough synthesized violinists to make purely synthesized things. The hybrid method of recording real string input, but using the physical measurement of the body response is a good compromise on that. Pure synthesis, um, so far, as far as I know, if anyone could make it work, I'd be very interested to know, but we tried and failed. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> no, it was a good interruption, actually. I, I don't know whether there are other questions, actually. Well, there was, uh, uh, yeah, a question about, of course, the uh, the research that's been done at Harman, you know, on both loudspeaker and, and headphone testing. 
Um, I don't know if you, how familiar you are with that research. Um, well, uh, I, you know, I may make a few comments because, uh, you know, I read the Floyd Tool book on loudspeaker testing, but um, um, they've been able to get fairly consistent um, um, evaluations on loudspeakers and now headphones um, from listeners, and they correlate pretty well with a a set, and it's not a single, but a set of measure objective measurements on the loudspeakers and headphones. Um, so, my, I guess my one comment on that versus violins, though, there's a one major added complication with violins, which is that there's the player involved. With uh, loudspeaker and headphone testings, you just have a recording and you just play that. So there's a whole interaction with the the players and the instrument that doesn't exist with uh, loudspeakers and headphones. So you know, one of the one of the months many interesting questions is, well, are listeners' preferences correlated with players' preferences? For example, I think this was basically raised, you know, in a previous question. Yeah, I think there are a couple of works by by Fritz uh, that actually show that they're yeah they might be correlated, but they are not exactly the same because, well, the reason is simple actually because player uh, gets also uh, let's say a, a, a touch feedback from the instruments, no, and uh, you will like it or not, even uh, according to the fact that it matches your uh, body frame, your uh, I mean if you are thin fingers or not. Uh, in fact, instruments require that you adjust them to the player somehow. So um, I think also that the style, as I said before, for instance, uh, I had this instrument who was responding very strongly, and then the other one uh, that was responding less, but they were suitable for two different uh, uh, repertoires. So my preference would depend in that case. Yeah, and, and my, my comment on that, uh, two comments. One is that, uh, you know, uh, instruments are tools. So uh, there's no evidence that a single tool is optimal for everything. Um, my, my, my other comment is, you know, from personal experience, you know, amongst good violins, really good violins, um, the preference for the instrument for the players comes less from the direct sound, but the actual response, which is, I think, what Martin, you know, was discussing previously, that the way the instrument responds to the player is highly important because, you know, no note is a single, steady, static note, and the evolution of the note is all important to the player, and so how the instrument responds to that is all important, and I know, you know, personally, as I gain more ex experience with instruments, my memory of instruments is more and more has to do with the response of the instrument rather than just the direct sound per se. Could I dive in? Um, sure. Um, I was working on a, a, a paper with Claudia um, last year. It's it was very long and as yet not published, but one of the um, recurring findings looking at multiple line tests was that with players, they disagree among themselves quite a lot about which violin is preferred or in each whatever thing you choose. Um, so they have stronger, you've got a bigger range of opinions about each violin, but they disagree among themselves. With listeners, it's much subtler range of reactions, but there's much more agreement among them, among the listeners. So in a sense, the, the listeners are more objective in that you'll get a better average, but it's you have to have a, a high signal to noise ratio to be able to tell it. Um, players, they be, react very strongly. Um, go, going back to what Martin was saying about wanting to have something that excites the emotion in the player, I think that's that's quite true when you're having players judge instruments, but you weren't trying to do that. You're trying to have listeners um, judge instruments, in which case, in, in my experience, you could play a five-note scale or you could play you know, opening of Tchaikovsky or whatever beautiful piece you want after the 25th repetition, it's not going to evoke any emotions at all, except maybe um, boredom and irritation. So um, it's a very different situation, I think, getting having players judge in their own time than the sort of thing you're doing. So I, I think what you did is a very good 
thing. It's a, one of poss many possible ones, but I, I think it was an admirable choice. I, I would I would call a name for this. It's uh, I would call it the, the the maker paradox. So a violin is better judged by a listener, but in fact, the guy who is buying it is a player. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah, convince the player. <laughs> Very true. Okay, George. Hi uh, there. Thanks. Um, I guess to say once again, thanks for sharing your research with us. Uh, I think there's a. I think we all feel there's a lot that's robust there. But I'd, li I'd like to bring you back to something you mentioned earlier about the time um, domain variations in sound. Because I don't really believe you can qu possibly quantify timbre without uh, looking at that as well. Because you know the simple experiment, you can take the very best note that you can find on any violin anywhere in the world, take out one cycle and repeat it. It just sounds, goes, Zzz. it sounds horrible. So there are really two, there are two aspects to the time evolution of, of a note. Like one would be things like the, the attack and how you shape the bowing and how you conclude it you know, the stroke and all that side of it. Then there's another one where if you try to bow a long note with absolutely no change in timbre at all from one end of the bow to the other, well, you can't actually do it. And no two cycles are the same. Um, I've done a bit of work on this, trying to uh, um, cor cross correlate all cycles with each other as, as an image. And I've done um, I found later on that Bob Schumacher did something a bit similar. Right, really, right. I think back in the 80s, uh, Jim yeah, will know exactly yeah. when he did it. Um, and then I've done other things like trying to synthesize notes that uh, that actually contain these time variants by uh, knocking some of the um, harmonics out of tune and giving them different decay factors. And I think I've had some degree of success in emulating uh, violin sound that way. But overall, the, with these, these methods, particularly the uh, analysis of trying to get this um, the change from cycle by cycle into some it, graphic, there are so many um, pitfalls a, along the way in, in terms of your the methodology can introduce artifacts and then mislead you. But um, so uh, apart from making the point that I, I think Tambra doesn't exist without this uh, time domain uh, dimension to it, I was wondering whether you actually had any thoughts about how you go about investigating that. Uh, Save me the trouble. <laughs> but, uh, uh, on the first part of uh, where you or your comment, I can definitely say that although the player was playing a simple scale, if you listen to the old recording, it was actually modulating the scale in the sense that it was not uh, uh, let, let me explain this well. It was not a machine. Uh, and actually, uh, each note was sounding slightly different every time. So fortunately, there was some uh, time variation in the timer. So uh, it was a human being. Uh, although, of course, uh, pretty much all the scales sounds identical or, or on an expert list. Um, I, I, I lost the second part of your question because uh, uh, it, was, it was my my wife calling me. <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry. So I, I cannot answer to the second part of the question. How about from a physical point of view, of course, that's, that is very interesting. I also agree that uh, studying carefully the Fine domain response of violin would be wonderful. Uh, by the way, my expertise in, 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 in physics is time domain quantum mechanics. So uh, I, um, I resonate with this kind of approach. But mm. honestly, so we all do Fourier transform because it's easy or because we are lazy and uh, we don't want to dig into the complications or uh, of uh, analyzing the full time dependent response. I don't know if, if Professor Huda was. Uh, has done studies along these lines. I wouldn't, I mean, it, it is a difficult uh, problem because it involves, uh, as we said, no, not only the response of the violin, but also the way you bow it. And uh, that is very subtle. But clearly there are substantial differences from one note to another on the same yeah. violin and very big differences from one violin to another. 
So it seems to be one of those things where, where we know there are differences. We've done more or less nothing to investigate that. So, uh, I mean, it, you seem to have some of the necessary background. I mean, how can you suggest some avenues that we could go down to uh, to kind of make some inroads into this problem? I mean, how would you how would you do it? Say, given a a recording of a of a single note of a violin, how would you then compare that to another similar recording? Yeah. I don't know even either uh, how a mechanical bower sounds. I've never listened to it. So if you like make a, a roll of, of uh, instead of bowing it directly, you put a, a, a fixed weight on the violin. How does that turn out? Uh, I, I knew there was such an apparatus in Cremona at some point, but then it disappeared probably. So I would like be curious because that is a kind of uh, midway between a real player and the synthesized sound that, that we we know it's very hard to, to be synthesized. But, but there is a little thing. There is this, a... These time variants from one cycle to another, though. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah can I, I, I can comment a little bit on a mechanical Boeing because I've had some experience with two different Boeing machines in the yeah. context of trying to take the variable, that variable out of testing strings. And it turns out that Yes, you can take the human variable out of testing strings, but you can't take the bow variable out of testing strings if you use a bow. And it turns out that it is essentially impossible to bow a steady state note with a bow. At least yeah. we haven't figured out because there are fluctuations, um, it's, you know, um, due to the bow and, uh, you know, and the hair interaction wobbling up and down. And it's almost impossible to get the machine to bow consistently reliable. So we actually gave up on trying to use a mechanical bowing machine <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, to try to tease out certain things. Um, Joseph, you're muted. Joseph, you're muted. Excuse me. Um, I, um, over the decades, I've had um, Tried a few different things. Very early on, with 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 Gabi, um, we 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 measured the frequency response of the violin, and then he created a scale um, using a fully synthesized um, um, kind of a, a bowed string. And then, if you convolve the two, the notes from one to the next sound strikingly uneven. Um, when you give that violin to a violinist. They are doing the same thing, but the fact it doesn't sound uneven means they are automatically compensating. Um, so, if we go to your comment, um, Carlo, about these violins being apparently the same loudness, I would rephrase that. I would say they were played at about the same loudness. Now, I think if you took um, a impulse response of each of those violins and convolved it um, with whatever you like, you would find that they didn't sound the same loudness. I think from what I could see from those um, FRFs, the Strad B would sound the biggest, the loudest, D would sound the smallest, and the others would fall yeah, in between. I agree, I agree, I agree. Okay. I, it, they were purposely sound, sounded at an equal level. So we instructed the, the violinist to play that way because we knew that if you allow a violin to be louder, it will be automatically preferred and then your evaluation of timbre is gone, but I agree. Okay. And why would we want to get rid of the most obvious way of getting at preference though? Well, because that's easy. I mean, measuring loudness on violin is, is kind of easy. Uh, so is it? It is, well, respect to measuring timbre, it is, uh, no? Timbre is uh, more uh, subtle yeah. to quantify while uh, loudness is relatively more easy. Well, one would think, but over the years, people studying quality have never studied that. They've always have normalized the FRFs and pretended it, it didn't exist, except for way back with with um, with Saunders and Heifetz. They determined that loudness is good, but since then, it's been really factored out. Um, so I, I think there's a there's a kind of negative associations with loudness, with which I think maybe Martin first noticed in his. Um, associations, didn't you, Martin, with, with loud height? People didn't like the word. Um, um, and we found that in Paris, like 
people don't choose loudness as an as a association with pro projection, even though they clearly do are using it when they judge. So um, I, I um, not that you shouldn't have done what you did do, but I, I think that getting rid of loudness, you're getting rid of a lot that's important about a, about a violin. Yeah, yeah, I agree. But again, in this case, we aim to to really single out the, the timbre qualities of the violins. No? So see if, if one was preferred just because of, it, uh, of its uh, uh, timbre. And that okay. is the point. But, but of course, clearly, if you have a louder violin, it will be, it will be preferred sooner or later. I was, I was too a little bit confused by the terminology. Pleasant, do you effectively mean preferred? Yes, I, w I would say so. No, do you agree, Massimo? It, it's just pre preference, yes. I think, yeah, I, think I, I would, would put that in right well, away. Well, the one you prefer, yes. If yes. you, if you I mean, if I, yeah, definitely, yes. What you like uh, more or most, uh, this, this was the question. So it's better. Because then it makes sense to me to see how the individual components add up to that. Where when you say pleasantness, it's, is that an independent quality or some sort of summation? Uh, I assume the was the test done in Italian or English. Uh, uh, it was done in Italian, yes. We were and, in Cremona. Uh, the majority of the audience was Italian. Yeah. Right now, I don't know, and really any Italian, but what was the Italian word? You know, piacevole. For pleasantness. Piacevole. Piace, piacevole, but it translates pretty directly to pleasant. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, Martin. Just, just a, a comment about uh, the, the attributes which we choose. Um, I would agree with Joseph that loudness is extremely important at, uh, when people try instruments. And one point why it's important um, is just goes back to my first point about music and emotion, because when people feel the instrument can be played loud, they have the impression that they can express a lot about what they want to express it gives them freedom the freedom of expressing myself because i feel very strong resonances and they what, what um, uh, the music musicians like is to to become one unit with the instrument to express yourself and to have freedom of expression and if the, the instrument is not loud they immediately feel i don't have the freedom to express myself and i think most of those um, listening tests um, for me they a weak point is that we with the science scientific thinking um, try to separate the instrument from the player and to say we have to, to to judge the instrument and this actually I think is a mistake we cannot separate the instrument from the player because what we want to judge is the unit which can be created between instrument and human and so this might be joseph because of your very oh, interesting why? comment um, um why the listeners are more um, equal in judgment because what they judge is i have the impression now i feel a wonderful touching unit between a, a, a human and his instrument and the players, they try to find out, ah, it's not my soul, it's not my voice, I, I, I don't get into the tone. They are not happy, they, they, they are not in, in, in freedom and peace. And so it's, it's very difficult, but we must, we should try to, 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 to focus on the unit which can be created rather than on the instrument. And this makes it so wonderful because this is the reason why we have 10,000 violin makers in the world because it's not a technical goal which we achieve, but we, we do something like bringing a, a, a couple together which marry the, the, the musician and the instrument. So we, it's, it's much more emotional, which, which we have to uh, accept. Yes, Martin. And, and uh, but, you know, as an engineer, we're trying to reduce what you've described to, you know, under the umbrella of playability. We're hoping that somehow, you know, there's something, uh, some objective measurements under the umbrella of playability, you know, that might describe, help us, um, you know, make that connection. And, and we do realize, you know, um, yes, there are limits to what, um, what we can comprehend and 
figure out from the you know frequency response functions. Um, yes, but all the, it, it confirms what I say because playability just means I am able to express what I want to express. Yeah, I, I totally agree. But, but, we, but of course, we also want to try to, we assume that there's got to be some also physical measurements that correlate to that and, and different you know, instruments with different is, responsive, fun, you know, the way they respond differently. Um, some of that should show up um, in certain measurements if we can figure out the, course, yes, you know, the appropriate course. measurement. Yes. Uh, uh, yes if I may in, interrupt both of you. Uh, yeah, yeah, no. Uh, one thing, uh, one thing uh, uh, that was different, um, at least in our study, in comparison to the previous ones that were playing antique and old violins, is that, for example, this time listeners were just simply listening to the violin and not playing the violin. Uh, and I, uh, if I understand you, but uh, please I repeat for the hundred time that I'm not an expert on violin. But I, I, I but. Uh, for example, when I was playing guitar, playing a guitar or listening to a guitar were two different things. In the sense, when I was judging a, a guitar by playing it, uh, I could feel the guitar, I could understand whether my hand was appropriate for the neck and so on. There were several factors that were coming into play when I was playing and listening just the guitar was a completely different story. In our experiment, uh, people they were just simply listening to the yeah. sound of the violins. So... Uh, and I think that this was definitely like, let's say, a novelty of our study in comparison to the literature, I would say, at least in, in the literature on antique violins, of course. Well, thank you. Uh, 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 an analogy I like to use is um, a really bad way to evaluate a tennis racket is to watch a tennis match at Wimbledon. <laughs> I mean, I'm similarly listening to good violin is, is, is just not what's the main thing that's going on. So um, I think with, with violins, we get caught up on trying to, we're only being interested in, in measurements that can directly correlate with quality, but that seems to me um, lacking in, in common sense. Violin makers are always using measurements that aren't related to quality. When they do the thickness of the violin, no one's going to throw away their caliper and no one's going to pretend they can equate it with quality, but it's enormously useful and reassuring to be able to, to do it while you're, um, you're making. Um, with cars or almost anything else where engineers have had a good um, deal of input, there are all sorts of measurements which you present with the car, so to speak, or the stereo. This is the horsepower. This is the frequency response. No one's saying that means you're going to prefer the car but it's useful information that will mean different things to each player. So I think we, as people interested in measuring things and quantifying, should absolutely keep doing that regardless of whether we come up with some univised, um, um, you know, universal theor theory of a good violin. I don't think that's likely because that's not the point of art or anything else. But anyway, that's my... Oh, can I introduce more on a comic note? You brought in the um, Ferraris and Cinquecento's and people are always comparing Stradivari's and Ferraris. Um, I've been working on, a, on, a, on an article actually about that. And if you go to Ferrari's website, um, they like to compare themselves to musical instruments. In 2020, they posted one that starts off with a violinist playing on a Vesuvius Strad in Cremona, Paganini, cut to the Ferrari research facilities where they're trying to get the right sound of an instrument it can, out of a out of a car, it can take a year to get the right sound. It, it, it's kind of like instrument making. I mean, these kind of analogies we're using are are are, are really kind of universal. And with um, when they're trying to sell a Strad Viola for forty five million, that same year they're trying to sell a a Ferrari for thirty six or for above three million. It, the Ferrari sold for what? The Strad didn't sell. The Ferrari sold for a world record amount. But in the videos they use to compare them, they show a violist playing loud and fast. They show a Stradivari. They show a race car driver driving loud and fast. And, you know, listen to the sound of that. Isn't that wild? They're talking about the Ferrari there, not the violin. It's so um, interesting, these sort of <laughs> cross-modal things. But anyway, this is just for comic relief. <laughs> but I often think it'd be good to play a little clip 
of one of those videos before talks like this but, um, <laughs> put in perspective. All right, um, John. Uh, yes, the uh, I'm as you look at your input measures, I'm wondering if you increase the variance or you reduce the variance by having a professional violinist play all the notes and approving them each time he plays them, as opposed to a crummy violinist playing them. And then because they have less power control over the bow, there would be more variance based on the violin and not the violinist possible. Yeah, I mean, yeah I, I, I remember in one of the first, uh, let's say, preliminary trial, we also were thinking about using two different violinists, one consistently playing the reference violin, so always the same violin, and the other rotating between the test violins, A, B, C, D. Uh, and that was useful because it helped to redu reducing the time between one listening and the other. <laughs> But it's really hard, uh, so you you really have to so to match performances is is somehow quite hard. We found it was quite hard, or we couldn't find two two violins, violinists really matching each other. Yeah. Uh, so you could always kind of tell uh, that there was something going on between the two performances. Uh, didn't work out. I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> this would be the same amateur playing both violins. It's just yeah. that they wouldn't, they wouldn't be able to play them as well. So more yeah, of the I character so. of the violin and less of the bowing might come out. Yeah. Actually, when I saw the recordings, uh, it was really amazing the job these violinists did because they're really boring. So they're really, really boring. So he managed <laughs> to play them exactly... Uh, <laughs> And we, we have to work on that because, for instance, even playing a simple scale, you naturally, uh, for instance, you naturally try to to play the, the last uh, notes longer or slow it li uh, lightly down. Uh, and here to, to work on that, to, to play boringly on purpose, it was really difficult. Yeah. Thanks. All right, um, Martin? Yes, uh, maybe. I'm saying the same thing again and again. <laughs> Sorry if it's like this. Um, I just would like to, to, to emphasize um, that beauty is complicated and we really should accept the complications about it and not make it simple in order to make to be objective. Um, but looking for a higher level of objectivity um, and so my, my favorite analogy of what, what means to play a violin is, um, and it helps me a lot to understand the violin in a, in a much deeper way, is uh, since three years ago, I've, I absolutely fell in love with horses. And I started riding in my high age um, horses. And it was about 30 different horses that I could ride in the last three years. And uh, there are some horses I totally fell in love. And they objectively, they are not the best horses. Uh, so you could say, oh, the bag is a little bent and the shoulder is like this. So you could judge the horse, but that's not the point. The point is what happens when I ride this kind of horse. And so I say, I can trust this horse. And if I can trust him, the horse, you create a, a, an incredible unity in the same movement with the horse and a, a very deep feeling of very deep joy. And this happens, it's exactly what happens when playing your violin, which is your voice. You can trust this instrument, you will create a totally different music, a different emotion, and people start to feel very trustful with their instrument and they create beauty. So for me, the, the main point is to, 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 to understand, to better understand the unity between the violin and the player, between the horse and the person who, ride, who can ride this horse. And so my violas, for example, they totally have changed. They are much better now than my violins and than the cello I made. Uh, maybe my viola, the violas we create in the workshop are one class better than the violins because of the horse I can ride every week, which is a, a draft horse, 800 kilo. And he taught me what the viola means. The depth of the viola is much deeper than the cello, 
No, uh, and so, so you, it's it's the question of of unity, of trusting, and and to understand. And this touches people when they listen to the music and they say it's a wonderful violin. Of course, it's not the violin; it's just what they experience between the player and the violin. So, so how, I, how how would you translate that into an experimental technique, though? I mean, I, I agree with you, but if you have to do an experiment, what maybe, what, what should we take from yes, that? Yes, maybe. Um, uh, for when you there, there is some similar research with horses and people, and you can see um, when when I stand beside a ho this horse, which I really love, and he loves, he has changed his character since he knows me, and he's my big teacher. He's my teacher, this horse. And um, you can immediately see he synchronizes his breath. It's the same. We breathe the same. Um, in the same way, and even in, in um, the United Kingdom, they made a research that even the heartbeat is synchronized between the horse and the person. And so, of course, we could play the violin and we could check our, our body um, um, me me medically. What how does it change our, our, our heart? How does it change our brain? It's, it's the, the, the goal of the violin is joy. That's the reason why you make music. It's joy. So we, it's, it's rather um, analyzing what happens with the player when he plays this instrument, rather than I play a scale and I judge something which is not important to the player. So can we create something like um, the amount of joy which is created, the amount of how do I feel after I... Sometimes when, when people... Um, Try to find out if they buy an instrument in my workshop, and then they come to the workshop and they want to find out if it's their instrument. Sometimes I, I ask them just to 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 watch how do you feel after you play the instrument, not while you play the instrument, but after you play the instrument. What what does the instrument? How does it change you? And that's actually the the point why we go into concerts. We want to be touched. We want to be changed. So we have to analyze the person rather than the instrument to understand what is a good instrument for this person. So it's, I, I would just say we have to make it more complicated. We make it too simple since think, many, many uh, decades. If I, if I may uh, try to give a, 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 I would say a, a scientific answer is that definitely this type of study, our study, but also the previous one, have revealed like a, a um, the main ingredient of our recipe, but none of the study is giving us the holy grail uh, as, Carlos, as Carlo was suggesting. So we, we now know some factors, for example, which might grossly di divide between, I don't know, good and bad violins, for example, which is an easy distinction. Um, as far as fine distinction is concerned, I think that there is a lot of work to do. So for example, uh, in our experiment, we could definitely discriminate well between the uh, industrial violin and the good ones. And uh, we can find several factors that highlight this difference in one way or another. And this is a very large dis distinction. As far as fine distinction is concerned, uh, there is definitely on our side a lot of work to do. And I do understand many of the things you are saying in this sense that uh, I mean, many factors come into play uh, at that point. Uh, but we are, uh, in your case, you are talking about very subtle differences. Uh, let's say that, for example, in, in my opinion, scientific research so far has revealed uh, very large differences. So the differences between, I don't know, a very bad violin and a very good violin, not the small ones. Carl, do you have any final words uh, before we end this uh, section? Well, no, it's uh, what Mar Martin says is very interesting, of course, but uh, it's way far beyond the current uh, possibility of physics and engineering, I would say. I'm aware that there are studies uh, in which uh, the emotional response of people and uh, how their brain react uh, are being performed, but that is not really my field. I'm not uh, knowledgeable in that. Um, I thought that for makers, actually, uh, the, this, this engineering part is, is anyway interesting because, uh, well, when you have to make a violin, you want to, to know how it works and how it uh, somehow uh, it, it sounds is related to its manufacture. So 
clearly this doesn't rule out the fact that we have to move to a further uh, degree of complexity, but um, yet we have long way to do to, to run uh, even in the simple problems. So before reaching this, this uh, very high level, I hope one day we will be able to do that. All right, thank you so much. Let's give them a great round of applause. <laughs> thank you guys. Yes, uh, thank you so much for sharing your research with us. And uh, so we end our usual